So, and so, that's when I started planning to hurt people. And and so what I'm kind of hearing is that you were already being judged for being mm-hmm. guilty of particular things that you had not done. Welcome, my friend. Well, um, so let's start with this. Can you tell me a little bit about what you go by? Uh, so I typically go by JC or Jeremy in the real world. So okay. either is fine. So um, thanks for coming today, JC. Uh, and, and I understand that you have a little bit of an unusual background or experience. Yes, very much so. And can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, so growing up, uh, I hit a point in my life uh, in middle school where I almost hurt a bunch of people. Okay. And can you tell me a little bit about how you kind of got to that point? Uh, so kind of TLDR, uh, very unstable home life plus being bullied. Uh, okay. And to give like a very quick recap, uh, my older brother, when I was six, was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Okay. Uh, and my dad was retired Navy and a firefighter. So he only really understood rank and wasn't very emotionally available. Okay. Uh, he also had a video game addiction. So he would come home mm-hmm. when he wasn't working and basically sit on the computer and play uh on a website called Pogo, so like card games and stuff like that. Interesting. uh, And watch the TV. Uh, My mother was hardworking as well. Um, My older sister was very controlling, and they were also very sheltering uh, because of what they did as work. Uh, What does that mean? They were very sheltering because of what they did as work. uh, So my dad, as a firefighter, dealt with a lot of the worst parts of society sometimes. Mm. Uh, I remember one time I came from home school when I was about nine and my mom stopped me and was just like, Hey, uh, do you remember that girl that went missing? Uh, Your dad was on the search party that found them. Oh boy. So you're going to be extra good today and give your dad space. Uh, So that was... When you have parents that deal with that type of situation fairly often, uh, they're very protective of their kids because they don't want that to be their kid. Interesting. So so w- when your mom was saying you need to be extra good today, you're mm-hmm. sort of interpreting that as them being protective of you? Yes. So it's mo- not necessarily of me, but just like don't cause any drama like... You know, if you don't get the dessert you want, don't, you know, make a big deal out of it. So more, don't let drama happen that doesn't need to happen because your dad's already stressed. I see. So so for you to not add to the stress. Yeah. And complaining uh, about, uh, I'm just a little bit confused because ha- what does that have to do with being overprotective? Uh, so just with my dad constantly dealing with like finding and dealing with kids in very bad situations Uh and him not wanting me to end up in those situations. uh, They pretty much didn't let me do anything outside of got it. Like two, maybe a block away. So like always in visual range of the house. Yeah. uh, Never going to birthday parties or something unless they were physically there. Got it. But they were always working all the time. So that makes a lot of sense. What I was kind of just noticing is that it seems that, you know, your mom was also placing some degree of responsibility on you for keeping things smooth because your dad was already stressed out. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's wild, dude. So it sounds like your, your family was quite, um, understandably uh, concerned about your safety and, and used, I think the word controlling earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so it sounds like you were, and that's what you would call an unstable home life. Uh, there is a lot more that kind of comes with that just because, uh, keep in mind, this is also the first generation with the internet and social media. Uh, so Facebook is literally coming out, okay. uh, when I'm hitting middle school. So okay. it, they don't know how to deal with that because nobody knows how to deal with that because that's never existed before. Uh, there's not a lot of good resources on mental health. Uh, so having a child that's diagnosed with this relatively new disease, uh, that's uh, bipolar, bipolar disorder. disorder. Okay. Yeah. And you said uh, your brother was six. 
Uh, I was six when he oh, was diagnosed. Uh, you were six. Okay. Okay. So he was, I think, 11 or 12. Okay. Uh, and so uh, everything that comes with that, uh, it, it didn't make for a very stable or welcoming home life. What does that, um, and, and if you don't want to share more details, <laughs> you know, about your brother and family, like that's totally fine. But I'm kind of curious um, what comes with that. Because I've seen a lot of different responses to an 11-year-old being diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Uh, so drug use, uh, just very big mood swings. It could be fun hanging out, and then all of a sudden he's very angry, uh, very rebellious, so a lot of arguing with my parents. And so I'm the little kid just sitting in the corner listening to yelling matches uh, in the living room. And, and what do you remember about your experience of those things? Uh, so a lot of it, I just essentially was just like, my job is just to stay out of the way and just not be noticed. And Okay. Makes sense, right? Like, so like yeah. stuff is going down in the house and, and you're not really yeah. sure. It's not your responsibility to deal with. You're, you're kind of trying mm -hmm. to be, you don't want to add to the, you don't want to pour gasoline on the fire. So yeah. you got to kind of just... Try yeah, to keep your it, head down. Yeah. And, Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So couple of that with school life. Uh, so in second grade, uh, I became a gifted kid. Uh, My condolences. <laughs> <laughs> how, how did you uh, become a gifted kid? <laughs> uh, I was just really good at math. And uh, there was like some test that they had me take. And like I was already doing like sixth grade level math in like second grade and they're like okay yeah you need to be challenged more and so we'll take you out of school for a week and put you in these other classes to mm. challenge you more and uh, what was that like uh that was interesting uh there was a level of clout that came with it at least at like the young age uh as that got older it became less cool but uh, okay so you, it sounded like you were a little bit pri proud of being a gifted kid, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's like good for you. Yeah. 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 So, but also, you know, when you are a gifted kid, you tend to not develop those social skills and not already kind of have them naturally. Uh, so I like to IQ my way out of things. Uh, what, what, help me couldn't... understand that. What, what do you mean by tend to not develop social skills? How's that related to being gifted? Uh, well, I guess it had more to do with just my situation in general, with my parents being overprotective. Uh, like I would, I never went to a birthday party until I think I was like twelve. Wow! And so, like it was, I didn't have anything outside of school when it came to social interactions. Uh, okay. Well, school and church, but church there wasn't really much interacting. It was just sitting there and listening to the guy talk for the most part. Okay. And do you mind if I ask what kind of church you were attending growing up? Uh, it was a Southern Baptist church. Okay. Um, and what do you mean by, I was intrigued by this phrase, IQ your way out of things. Can you tell me about that? Uh, so kind of think like character build, like you always, you kind of stack up in one stat, like the IQ stat. Uh -huh. and so it's like, I'm not going to, I don't have social skills, but what I can do is study psychology and then be like, okay, well, I don't understand this necessarily, but psychology says if I do this, people will like me. And so it's not necessarily the intuitive social skills. It's taking more broad, general things and uh, applying the intellect to it. And did you that find that sense. that was effective? Uh, much later on in life, uh, there was a lot of other things that I had to deal with first, as we'll kind of get to. Okay, sure. Uh so that's kind of growing up up until middle school. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this is where like that lack of social skills really started to show. Okay. Uh, and bullying became a very like daily part of my life. Uh, and then also puberty. Uh, I was also in the closet and this is in the South in early 2000s. So there's not... Uh, any type of positivity towards that okay uh, or understanding of it uh to say the least so and can i ask so a couple that questions definitely... about that mm -hmm. so when you say bullying um what 
what did that look like? Why did it happen? Like, what's your understanding of how it started? Uh, people figured out that I didn't have social skills. And so they would be just like, hey, like, this person likes you. You should go say this because they're into this. And then I'd go do that because I wanted friends. And then they would react negatively towards that interaction. And so it was like that type of things. Okay. Uh, so, th so they realized well. that you could be taken yeah. advantage of. And if they told you to do something. Yeah. So that worked for a little bit. And then it just name calling. Uh, and then that led to depression. And then there was just some really just outright bullying. Uh, we would walk to class at a, or walk to lunch in a line. And so there was one time I still vividly remember uh, I was carrying my lunchbox and there were three kids that were literally trying to jump and stomp the lunchbox out of my hand with the teacher three feet in front of us. And the teacher was just like, y'all should stop. And like, that was their only punishment was them being told to stop. And did they stop? Uh, they did it one more time and then stopped. And, and what do you mean uh, stomp on your lunchbox? Are you holding your lunchbox? Yeah. So we're walking in a line. And so like uh, it had a handle. Uh -huh. And so I was just holding it by my side and they were walking in line. They'd run up and then like take their foot and try to get it in between the handle. Got it. And the rest of the lunchbox and literally just tried to stomp it to the ground. What kind of so, stuff did you take to lunch at, in middle school? Uh, so I took a peanut butter sandwich, a bag of Doritos, and then some sort of like Debbie cake or zebra, you know, star yeah. crunch, one of those things. Uh, and I literally, I had that every single day from like the time I was like five up until like, I think 11th grade when I finally started buying school lunches. When you, when you uh, say peanut butter sandwich, was there jelly on there too? Or was it just peanut butter? No, just peanut butter. Interesting. Wasn't yeah. that dry? Yeah. I don't know why. I just, I liked it. That's just, okay. yeah. One of the very weird, weird quirks I had that is inconsequential. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. So, so it sounds like you were bullied quite a bit. And, and mm -hmm. I'm also hearing that maybe teachers didn't step in or, I mean, did people know you were being bullied? Like how did people yeah, react our to that? Our town was very football focused, if that makes sense. So... Uh, Why don't you tell us what that means? Folks. Uh, so basically our, our entire town's economy ran around the high school football team because mm. they were so good. They were nationally ranked. Uh, my sophomore year, we had a game that was 103 of six. Wow. In football. So like, <laughs> that was like everything, like the sponsorships like it was either that or the military base that was nearby okay uh and so athletes got a pass for oh gg so you were saying um that that you grew up in a football town yes and yeah. athletes got a pass yeah so one of the kids that was doing it his dad was a coach of a different sport uh and so like I said, they didn't want to give up on sports because that was their big thing. And so it took a lot for athletes to kind of get actually punished for stuff. I see. And and so do you remember kind of what you what you were thinking, what you were feeling, what your experience of like going to school as a middle schooler was like? Uh, so it was I my goal was just to survive for quite a while. And it. There was a point where just like the, the bullying just kept adding up. I remember there's one moment in particular where uh, in gym class afterwards, I was getting bullied a lot because of, I think I dropped a pass or something like playing flag football or something like that. But like, again, football town. So like, that's a big deal. Uh, and I just remember oh, all of it kind of- By dropped a pass, you mean, you mean you failed to catch a ball? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and so I don't know if that can't remember exactly what all was said. I just remember being so angry at being bullied and, uh, nothing being done about it, uh, that I told someone was like, saw I was really mad and came up to me and was just like, Hey, what's going on? You look mad. And I was just like, I'm going to do 
this thing to hurt people. Uh, and then he went and told the teachers, as he should have. Uh, and this person was a peer of yours or an adult? Yes. Or what? Uh, it was a peer. Okay. Uh, and so I got suspended for a week, and they held a council to decide what to do. Uh, and so they put me on some, like, probationary thing uh, once I came back from being expelled. Uh, they held a or, council from for being, a week? Were, were you involved in that? No, it was uh, teachers and administrators being like, okay, like, something led to this situation. Like, what was it? And what did uh, they, do so, you have any sense of what they concluded? Uh, I don't. All I know is that they said, hey, if you mess up two more times, then you're getting expelled. Okay. Uh, so, so their response was punitive. Yes. And uh, what did your how did your family react to this, all this stuff? Like, would it, like, you know, kind of even tracking back, did they know that you were being bullied? Uh, to a certain extent, but there was very much like this kind of toughen up aspect. Like you just got to not let it affect you kid. And like, they'll stop if you just don't let them get to you type mentality. Okay. Um, I remember specifically, uh, just to kind of address like, further address the dynamic at home. When I was getting picked up from school uh, that day, uh, the, my dad said to me in the hallway as we were walking out was, do you know how bad this makes me look? And that moment's forever burned into my mind. Uh, and I remember walking by and there was a chick that was on the tennis team with me and I like mouth like help me because like I didn't know what to do. There wasn't any type of physical abuse or anything going on. I want to make that clear. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is just a lot of emotional neglect and that really exemplifies like what home life was like. Do, do you remember how you like, how you, so, so it sounds like you mouthed help me to an acquaint, acquaintance yeah. friend. Yeah, acquaintance would probably be the best way to describe it. Okay. And, and what, what were you thinking in that moment? Do you remember? Uh, I was, that was also the very first time I had ever gotten in trouble at school in general. Okay. Uh, and so there was a lot of emotions. It's just like, why am I getting punished for being bullied? Why is nobody who's supposed to be keeping me safe, safe? Why is it that he doesn't, my dad doesn't care about how I got to this point. He's only mad that it makes him look bad. That's rough, man. So, uh, so when, so that kind of happened and word kind of got out what I had said. And so when I eventually came back to school, it also got out that I could only mess up two more times before I got expelled. And so, uh, this is where the zero tolerance policy when it comes to fighting, I think actually hurts in a sense. Uh, and for those of you that don't know what that is, it's the, Two kids are in a fight. It doesn't matter who started it. Both kids get in trouble. And so kids knew I can't fight back or I get expelled. Uh, I remember there was, I think, three or four weeks later after me coming back, we were watching Remember the Titans for the umpteenth time. <laughs> and this kid kept uh, throwing this pin at the back of my head because we were sitting on the floor just trying to be annoying to me. And so I just set the pin like I grabbed it and set it in front of me and then he started pushing me and then he started punching me in the back of the head in the middle of the class while we're watching this. And then we both get in trouble because the coach was like, you should have got up and moved. And so since both of you can't come up with a solution to have solved this problem, I'm writing both of you up. And so at that point I had one more strike left and that how, was for me getting punched in the back of the head in class. And how did you, <laughs> what were you, how did you yeah. feel after that, man? Uh, that's insane. That's, so that's when I started to think, well, I'm, I've got to do something now. Uh, and then this is when the bullying really started to pick up even more because everybody was just like, he's got one more and, it kind of wow, became so really like pushing you to the edge. Yeah, it became almost somewhat of a sport to an extent. Uh, I remember like because of all this, like people were saying like you're gonna grow up to be 
a rapist, a murderer, a stalker, or gay. I don't know why all four of those are considered the same level, but Southern <laughs> Georgia at the time. Uh, and so it but was really building up to this point. And then that's when I kind of snapped. And that's when I started being like, okay, well, if that's what I'm going to be when I grow up, they're already right about that last one. Why wait on those first three? So, and so, that's when I started planning to hurt people. And and so what I'm kind of hearing is that you were already being judged for being mm-hmm. guilty of particular things that you had not done. Yeah. Right? People are thinking that you're a rapist, a stalker. Yeah. Um, and and it, it sounds like you, you mentioned earlier that you were in the closet at the time. So it, it sounds like you maybe were you yeah. aware of your sexuality at that point? I was at that point. Okay. And so And did other people know too or was it just no. a general insult? It was just a general insult. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um yeah. So broken so, clock can be right twice a day, huh? Yeah. You know. If you say enough bad things about some somebody, you know, eventually one of them's somewhat true, you know. And uh. And so I'm I'm a little bit curious like when you got written up by this teacher because the two of you had failed to come up with a amenable solution like what was your reaction to that well like i was mad like the like even more mad because i was just like why am i getting written up for this it's clearly no one's looking out for me and it's i've got to look out for myself and so like at that point like even the like administrator uh who we got sent to his office he was just like well, that kid looked like he had remorse and you look like you had no remorse for this situation. And so like I was being lectured. So uh, I see. So so you didn't yeah. do anything wrong. Yeah. You didn't like demonstrate it's... any remorse because you didn't do anything wrong. No, he didn't say that. He was just like, you didn't do uh, any remorse. And so yeah. that looks even worse on you because right. he obviously was sad about the situation and you're both written up for it. So you must have done something bad, too. And so you're not willing to own up to what you did on that. And he is. And you've got one more strike, mister. And so I don't know what you think you're doing causing all these problems. And so many failures at different levels of authority throughout my life. Kind of. I mean, did you try to explain? uh, Anytime I tried to, he was just like, you're just making excuses. So it, this was a very gradual thing over years that this built up. Uh, wow. And, and so I can imagine you felt quite resentful or. Oh, I mean, very much so. <laughs> and what, what kind of, like, what was that like for you or what were you kind of thinking? Uh, I, so I can't pinpoint an exact time that this happened. But during kind of this period is when I started to have like in a disassociated state. Uh, And so I think like the easiest way to describe it for people who don't know what that is, is like if you've ever seen Yu-Gi-Oh, like the original series where there's like Yu-Gi and then there's like the Pharaoh, that's like a different person inside him that is having a conversation. It was very similar to that. And I kind of felt like two parts of me starting to split apart into like this very hyper intellectual and this very emotional person and like them kind of fighting for control within myself. And, and And, what, what was each one striving for? Uh, it varied day to day. And so it was kind of like they were trying to convince each other who was right in this situation. And, what should be done about it. And so like once this kind of happened, it sometime around then is when like they it became very clear it was like separate. Like it was kind of like they were being pulled apart and then all of a sudden it became like very separated between this very hyper intellectual like just get through this like you know you only got five years left, and then you can move out and then never have to deal with any of this again. <laughs> That's and just, then just like, five years left. <laughs> yeah. Only half of your life that you've existed up until this point left. Yeah. And then there's the anger, like, let's do something. And so, like, there was this very clear, like, split between the two uh, at very, like, kind of around that point. Uh, and... 
at that point, the kind of angry guy was winning. And so, like, the logical guy was like, okay, let's start planning our revenge. Uh, and then that's when... And so vengeance is what working. you were looking for? Yeah. So, like, at that point, like, because of all the bullying and what had been said uh, about me, and this is, again, Cliff Notes version. These are just some of the highlights of many things that happened. Uh, at that point, I was just like, okay, like, let's start taking notice of things so we can hurt the people who have been hurting us. The administrators aren't doing anything to protect us. They're not going to do anything to protect them. This very vengeful mindset. I didn't understand. They're not going to do anything to protect them. What does that mean? Uh, that was just like the mindset I had at the time. It's like, well, they're not doing anything to help me. So if I do something to them, you know, they're so, just So gonna... they're like, it sounded like you were constructing a list. Yes. There, there was very much a list made. Uh, and... Uh, I'm not going to get into details as to, uh, I think for obvious reasons, but I started planning uh, and I actually got through uh, a dry run. Uh, and so, again, not going to go into any details, sure. but uh, I made sure my plan was going to work uh, and kind of tested it can, to a certain extent. So can I ask you, JC, so like were there particular people that – like, what would someone have to do to make it on the list? Uh, they were, like, the list kind of came immediately and it never changed. Got it. Uh, and so it was like, these are the people that are kind of like the ones that do it the most and the ones that lead everyone else to do. And and were you... And, and so I, I'm not getting the sense that you were, like, indiscriminately gonna hurt people it sounds like you were really looking for something like justice or vengeance uh there was plan for collateral damage uh to put it lightly uh but those were the people i was going to make sure faced justice it, so it was sense. like justice yeah. in your mind yeah uh it was very much like all right th this is it like if this is all I'm going to be, why wait? You know, they were right about the gay thing, so they're probably right about these other three. Might why as wait well. till I? Gr yeah. And so. and what were the kinds of? Um, so when when you use the when when I hear the word justice, I kind of think about like justice for crimes. And in your mind, what was? What were the crimes that these people had committed? Uh, like bullying, lying about me, just generally making my life hell. Uh. Okay. And so, so like, then, then what happened? Uh, so I had gotten through my dry run, uh, and then I was waiting for the next time for this to take place uh, to actually follow through with the plan. And a girl from a Fellowship of Christian Athletes decided to befriend me, uh, and then over the next month, I watched her get bullied into oblivion out of talking to me and, like, being friends. But she stood up for, like, a good month and made an effort. And then that's when kind of my logical side of that disassociated state started to take control again and be like, okay, like, no, the world isn't entirely evil. And, like, it started to push back against that and... So, like, that's kind of the, that month is pretty much like the very singular thing that stopped me from following through. So, so that, that's so interesting. I mean, so you said that this person decided to befriend you. How do mm -hmm. you understand what they, how does that, how do you understand that? Uh, she literally walked up and was like, I'm going to be your friend now. <laughs> so, like, she kind of was tired of it, uh, obviously, with her Ta Christian. Tired of seeing me being bullied and everything that was going on. She was also a cheerleader, like so she had some stuff to lose for befriending the weird guy. Wow. Uh, and so that really, it shook my worldview. Uh, but why that, did she do that? What do you... Uh, because of her worldview. Uh, because Which was what? She, you know, uh, Christianity. So like helping out the least of these, uh, you know, that type of mentality. And so she didn't 
have the best way. She didn't have the, uh, you know, PhD that she needed to help me deal with all my problems, but she provided community and enough of a challenge to the way I was viewing the world at the time to make me pause and think about what I was about to do. How did you respond when she walked up to you and said, we're going to be friends now? I didn't believe it until probably like a week later. And then watching her go through some of the same stuff that I had went through and or that I was, you know, being put through on behalf of me. And so... Very Christ-like. You know, like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and and so, so what was it like? Like, what did people do to her? Uh, started rumors that she was doing favors uh, for me, uh, to put it PG. Uh, oh, the irony. Was, <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, just... You know, there anything that you can think of middle school insult wise, like you know, like the, wow. They so put she, her so it. this was in middle, so she was like thirteen. Yeah, so the, we were all twelve, thirteen at wow. this time. Not so, easy to do when you're thirteen. No. So people especially started... when you're yeah, especially when you're a popular cheerleader. Sure. So like that, you know, as Hallmark movie as that is, you know, like. That really did kind of, again, it just shook my worldview. Uh, and that's also is about the time that I don't know if you know who Lecrae is. Uh, he's a famous Christian rapper, but he put out an album called Rebel. And uh, it's very much like all Christian philosophy of like, here's the way the world is and why. And he does it in like hip hop and like he he's tackling like all these questions that I had like why is the world like this and stuff like that and so that's when like again just it all kind of came down to like my worldview is very skewed at the front and so that's what allowed me to think I should be able to do these things and so it was that underneath starting to shift of my worldview that before we kind of helped me started go. to build a process to understand okay people are bullying me but does that make it what they're saying true yes or no but before so, we go down yeah. that road can i ask you a couple more questions about this yeah. this uh person so what when when they started getting bullied uh, or when they started so it sounds like people started rumors were there other things that happened uh people stopped hanging out with her you know after lunch like we all had to like go through the line sit down at lunch in the line and then we'd go outside to like the little patio area after we finished eating to make room for the rest of the students to have lunch. And like people would stop sitting with her outside and, you know, and social isolation. How did, how did that make you feel or how did you understand that? What did you think was happening there? Like at first I was just like, why is she putting up with us? Like what's going on? And then I kind of realized like two weeks into it, oh, this is happening because she's being nice to me. <laughs> Okay, uh, And so it took me a minute to kind of realize like, okay, this is what's happening. And then that's what really, again, shifting the worldview is like the main thing that I think helped or starting to question that is really what helped. So, but how did you understand, you know, if she's suffering because of befriending you, like what, did, how did you understand that? Like, okay, so two weeks in, you're starting mm -hmm. to figure it out. Mm -hmm. I'm responsible for this or she's doing like this is happening to her because she's befriending me. Like, what did that, what did you think about that? So part of it, I was just like, she's an idiot for doing this. But then too, it's just like, it's nice that somebody cares and is actually like not just saying it. And so like, it finally like gave me some sort of like external validation that I was worth something. Okay. So it sounds like you started to feel like you were worth something. Yeah. Yeah. So you, and, and you mentioned that the shift in the worldview. So like, can you kind of describe for me before this happened, what was your worldview? So at this point, I was very, uh, trying to think how, I think it's materialistic isn't necessarily the right naturalistic, I think is the like best way to describe it. Where like, Help me understand there that. is no, there is no supernatural. There is only the physical think, uh, Richard Dawkins esque. Okay. If that makes sense, where it's just like, uh, we're all just dancing to our DNA. Okay. Uh, if you've read, uh, 
of course, I quote the book. You can't remember the name of the book, but it's one of his more yeah. famous ones. Um, and and so so like like life is just it's biologically like reductionist. Yeah. And what 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 else did you kind of believe about the world? Like, what did you believe about like people and? Uh, I just believe that all people were jerks looking out for themselves. Okay. And so. So humans uh, are fundamentally selfish. Yeah. Uh, how did you understand what was happening to you? Uh, again, just like everybody's dancing to their DNA type mentality. Uh, and so it wasn't necessarily them choosing. It's just like, this is all just a natural process. And so, it, which is kind of ironic thinking like revenge doesn't even fit into Mm -hmm. that worldview sure uh, and so that also kind of gave me pause for thought like i was just like why would i want revenge if like this is all just biology sure or, so so it sounds know, like Adam's you started moving around. questioning that worldview and, and one of the mm -hmm. things you kind of realized is like okay like if this is just genes and dna then mm -hmm. how can i blame them yeah and w what else changed for you in terms of your worldview? You said it was rocked. What what were some of the foundations that were kind of affected? Uh, so the main one was just that relational aspect. It was just like, okay, if everybody's selfish, what was her motivation to doing this? And then like seeing that actually played out, you know, the Christian faith to a certain extent just actually lived out in somebody. And so just experiencing that was... Like, okay, it, even if it's in their DNA, like, there's still nothing that makes sense about that and why they would do that. Uh, and so this is when I just started to kind of question everything. Uh, fast forward a few years, I uh, had a teacher named Mr. Jordan teaching AP government. Uh, and it didn't still matter what... kid, JC. Yes. Uh, it did not matter what... Uh, your political philosophy was, he would challenge you on it. And so uh, it was funny. Anytime somebody would just be like, uh, spout some liberal view, he'd be like, he'd spout the conservative anti-point to it. And then a conservative kid would be like, yeah, that's right. And then he'd spout the part of the liberal view that the other kid didn't understand back mm -hmm. to the conservative kid. And so his kind of, whole philosophy is if what you believe can't withstand a question it's not going to withstand life hmm. and so that's when i really started to be again this is where again gifted kid iqing my way out of things i was just like now i'm just going to master philosophy and understand the world at the deepest level uh and so that's when i just started reading you know about islam hinduism uh you know all the different sex of you know like protestantism protestantism you know reformation the catholic tradition and what, what you know, were history. you looking for jc uh i was trying to construct a worldview that was consistent with reality and also consistent with itself uh there's a lot of different worldviews that i saw that were just like humanism really didn't make sense to me uh just because it's very much we come up with our own meaning and it's just like well like if we're coming up with it like that's very similar to like the naturalism worldview i had before just pretending to be religious okay uh, and so just through all these studies and years of it i kind of eventually settled on christianity uh as like the overall worldview okay that made the most sense and and so it's what were the what were the features of the world that you saw at that point that you were looking for? like so you were looking for a philosophy to explain a particular set of observations about the world right that has to be yeah. consistent with the world so what were the observations about the world that you had made oh uh, why are humans jerks sometimes was kind of the main one <laughs> okay. uh and then like how can people also be good but or like do good things but also, like, what makes people different and, uh, like, how can I explain, like, why some people are in good situations and some people are in bad situations? Uh, one of the most challenging questions I got uh, was, 
okay, well, that may be true in America, but uh, what if you're in South Africa and the hotel with uh, people outside wanting to kill you because of your race? It's like, how does your worldview account for that one? And it's like, it doesn't. So I need to think deeper about it. And mm -hmm. so it's... Uh, well, that sounds it like, like you've done a lot you, of work. Yeah, so... Uh, the way he put it is like, you guys, again, Mr. Jordan, is like, you guys have an American worldview or you guys have an American view. You don't have a worldview. And so, again, uh, wisdom from the AP class. Uh, Sounds like he had quite an impact on you. Uh, yeah, uh, just mainly just telling us to question everything and not be afraid of being wrong because it's about making progress, not perfection. And so it, it sounds like you... I'm I'm still uh, I appreciate you kind of sh sharing with us uh mm -hmm. what started to turn things around as well as I think what was kind of an accelerant for your mm -hmm. growth mm -hmm. um but I'm a little bit curious so like you know back when we left you in middle school and now you're in AP government yeah you still had one strike right so like what happened with the kids did they stop picking on you like how did you avoid getting expelled like what happened to the bullying so the bullying continued, but like at that point, I was just like, I just got to make it to summer and then I'll figure something out. Okay. Uh, and then my freshman year of high school, uh, they started a like probation program where if you didn't get in trouble for the first like six, or, like first semester, then we would wipe your record clean because we don't want that affecting you going to college okay. or trade school or whatever. And so... And that part never got public. And so I was just like, I just got to make it through these six months. Uh, and then also it was combining middle schools sure. uh, into the high school. And so there was more kids who didn't necessarily know about what had happened the year before. Uh, and then I had also, obviously parents had started to get counseling for me. Uh, that wasn't obvious. So, so how, how did that happen? Uh... So they already had a counselor in place because of my older brother being bipolar. So they just kind of started dragging me into those sessions. Uh, and so. And, and do you feel comfortable sharing a little bit about what those sessions were like or? Uh, it was very much like, what can you do yourself? Like there is very much a, it's all my dad's fault because he's a X, Y, or Z. Uh, That's what you were thinking. Yeah. And so it's just like my life is falling apart and everything is because people in authority aren't doing their jobs. Uh, OK. And then the, it was very much like, OK, like, let's say all of that is true. What can you do to make it? And so it was disregard what's happening to you to a certain extent. And it's like, how do you handle these situations the best you can? Yes, they may not be the best situation, but you can still handle them in a best way. Interesting. So, and so it sounds like you, you really took that to heart. Yes, eventually. <laughs> and how long did that take? Uh, probably a good year and a half uh, okay. to start applying it in any manner. Uh, and, and you started seeing the counselor when you were 13, like after the initial suspension? Uh. No, we we were already seeing them because of, uh, again, my brother. And okay. then I was already experienced depression uh, up until that point as well. So. And had you ever talked to your counselor about what was going on at school? Yeah. Uh, so they're not the the plan, if that makes sense. Sure. Uh, but definitely about the bullying and stuff like that. And so. And what did the counselors like? How, how did they respond to that? Uh. They're just like, you know what they're saying isn't true, so why accept it as true? It's like, you can choose if these things are not. Now, all this kind of went in or out the other Got it. Uh, at that age, because I was just like, another authority figure who is lying to me, at, at least in my mind at that point. Well, can I just pause and reflect for a second, JC? Mm -hmm. So the first thing, so first of all, I want to just really thank you from the bottom of my heart for having this conversation. Um, I, I think that and we'll, we'll, if we get some, uh, some time down the road, there's a video I want to share with you. And I'd, I'd love mm -hmm. to hear your thoughts about it. it. It went viral recently about someone who was, I guess, stalking a, a girl and, mm -hmm. and goes to report something to the police and then uploads the video himself. 
But I, I just like a couple of interesting observations. The first is when you talk about getting better, mm -hmm. you don't actually mention the counselor, which is so interesting because I think nowadays, myself included, as a mental health provider, right, as a psychiatrist and doctor, we frequently will recommend, and I still would recommend it, and we'll talk about that maybe a little bit towards the end, but we mm -hmm. recommend mental health treatment. But what, I, what I'm really hearing from your story, if we listen to you, mm -hmm. the really transformative factor was a peer, not a mm -hmm. counselor, and a teacher who like taught you a philosophy to question, whereas like right now I get the sense that, and we've even seen this frustration in our community where like, Everyone's like, just go see a therapist. And there are some people out there who have seen therapists. Mm -hmm. And what's it's kind of interesting because you kind of say it took you about a year and a half to really start this sinking in. And for a while, it was in one year, out the other. You even saw your therapist as part of the authority framework that doesn't really know what's going on, which mm -hmm. is really interesting. And and that that's just something that you said, obviously, I was seeing a counselor. It wasn't obvious to me at all. In fact, okay. I'm surprised to hear that because usually what we assume is that if there's a counselor in the picture, like you're gonna be fine. Yeah. So this is where I think we, America and the West in general is hyper individualistic. And then more Eastern countries tend to be very community focused. And it takes both. Uh, like you need both a community and, you know, a solid framework to live life from. Like you can't just exist uh like cbt is great but you still need community because you're a human being you know you're not designed to be on an island by yourself that's it, why solitary confinement so uh, and so punishing. when you say it takes both takes both to what what's what's to, the to, outcome yeah to be a healthy human like okay. you can't be a healthy human because humans are more or less by definition relational beings and so you need both community as well as counseling. And so it, a lot of people go very hard into one or very hard in the other. And you need both to, you know, you need mentors as well as community. It sounds like you have done a lot of reading and done a lot of thinking. Uh, yeah, th this again, this is 15 years ago. So I've had 15 years to make progress from this point. Uh so <laughs> wow that's yeah. that's awesome man um so okay so it sounds like the the bullying sort of faded away some you learned how to kind of handle it a little bit better and um and then you spent 15 years sort of like learning yeah. exploring like is there anything else that you kind of want to share about what your worldview is now uh or how so you understand the world so it's very much, I still believe in questioning things. Uh, the one thing that I've realized is like, everybody has a presupposition of some kind. Like originally mine was very naturalistic. It's like the world is only the physical atoms in the universe. And it's like that in and of itself is an assumption that cannot be proven and or disproven. Uh, and so I think the most challenging thing that I've been working through probably the past like four to five years is having a worldview that allows for other people to have worldviews that aren't the same as yours. Uh, and so being able to understand it from other people's perspective. So uh, JC, let me ask you like, um, can I ask you like, like some more almost <laughs> like general questions or questions yeah. that are more about externalizing your experience? So the first thing is, mm -hmm. What do you think are the features that lead to someone becoming like, you know, incredibly violent and hurting lots of people? Uh, so I would definitely say lack of mentorship, like have not having a mentor and then also not having a community. Uh, okay. There's actually a great uh, nonprofit near where I live called uh, Deliver Hope. Uh -huh. And so they work with youth that are put in the juvenile detention centers and stuff like that. Since they started, and they essentially what they do is they pair up people with a mentor, and that mentor meets with them once a week and checks in on them. Like, no agenda, just goes and hangs out with them and makes sure they're doing okay. Be that bigger brother figure. And since they started, the reincarceration rate for juveniles dropped 98%. Wow. 
Wow. That's why. So, so I think that's a very big factor. Uh, there was a, I'm trying to think of his name. Uh, I believe it was Vodi Bakum. He is a pastor in Zambia. Uh, he was talking about how in the African American community, as like the drug war happened and fathers started to be taken out of the homes, that's when violence started to rise in those communities. Hmm. And then now we're seeing a very similar split, like fatherlessness in the white communities. And now they're experiencing the same increase in violence in where their kids hang out, which is schools. Interesting. Uh, so I don't know exactly if that's correct or not, but I thought that was a very yeah. interesting observation that goes along with as mentorship gets taken away, healthy mentorship take, gets taken away, then that's when a lot of these like worldview questions don't have anybody to go to to mm -hmm. answer them. Uh, and so that's where having that community, especially ones with mentors, is so important. Uh, Thank you so much. So it, it sounds like you're you're kind of saying a lack of mentorship is incredibly key. A lack of community is mm -hmm. very very important. And, and yeah, if that is heavily responsible or a big influence in in terms of whether people become violent or not. Yeah. Um, what would you say? So like, how, what what are like the features of the mm -hmm. mindset that lead to mass violence? Uh, so like, uh, what does it look like? If, if I could like x-ray someone's mind, like, what do you think I would find? Uh, definitely, uh, a disassociation. Okay. Uh, what, so again, what do you mean by that? So like, uh, I think it's a clinical term, like the disassociated state where like they're detached from themselves okay. and like numbness and it's, uh, like a lot of cognitive dissonance as well. Uh, so not being able to accept f facts to a certain degree. Uh, okay. And so, uh, I think that's kind of the two big ones is it, it's developing again. It, I think it all comes back to worldview and then lack of community. I think those are the big things that. And, and what kind of worldview would you say people who. Uh, you know, do become violent? Like, what kind of worldview do you think they have? Uh, I forget who coined the term, uh, but they called it an anti-worldview. And so instead of you having a worldview where you believe in said principles, mm -hmm. it's you are anti-this. Like, it, Nazi Germany is a perfect example. It's not that they're built on for something, it's they are built anti-semitic they're anti anyone that's not and so instead of it being about principles that are healthy it's about those people are bad okay. and that's the driving force and in your mind who were who were the bad people and what made them bad uh obviously all my bullies and then authority figures for not doing their jobs and what was uh, their to job to protect to protect kids and be that mentor okay and and w w was there something that it, it, w it was just that they bullied you or is, or is there some other feature that you saw as like unifying your bullies and and kind of like separating you from them was there anything like that yeah uh, the bullying served as a way to like even reinforce that us versus them mentality and me uh and so because well, they were so against me personally yeah. for whatever reason that was very easy to justify uh the us th versus them mentality uh and then generalize that across the population so yeah i mean i think that makes a lot of sense because they're essentially creating the us versus them dynamic mm -hmm. which then yeah. you're just picking up and playing and the game that they're kind of laying out yeah you're just i think the yeah i think the big thing is just over generalizing that it's like were those people bullies and were they against me? Yes. Uh, but does that mean every human on earth is? No. Uh, and I think that's the other key factor with this quote unquote anti worldview is uh, I think we've all heard, uh, who is it? Daryl Davis, uh, the guy that 
uh, the blues musician who like went and hang out with KKK mm-hmm. members. And then, yeah. So like their whole worldview was built on like, or like the KKK's worldview is based on like this one black person I met didn't like me. And so therefore all black people are this way. And Daryl comes along is just like, no, we're not. And so it's racism is again, that over generalization of that one bad experience with one person and then extrapolating falsely some reason. And, you know, usually it's race uh, or political belief or whatever. It's sure. So that see, Republican or Democrat was mean to me. So therefore all Republicans or Democrats are mean. And, and like, so you mentioned earlier about being a, unable to accept facts. What, what I'm also wondering is in my experience working with people who are kind of like on this path in some way, for lack of a better term, um, mm-hmm. not only is there an inability to accept facts, but there's also a belief that certain things are factual. Mm-hmm. What do you think about that? Uh, I think that goes back to that overgeneralization. Okay. Uh, so they're going to find something that is true and then overgeneralize that to the population. Got it. So so they, they sort of start with like a cornerstone of, of something that may be factual and mm-hmm. then really extrapolate that and assume that the whole foundation that they build is factual. Yeah, they'll take something that's situationally true and make it universally true. I love that. Um. And so what do you what do you think needs to happen for people who are kind of on this path of of potentially heading towards violence? Like what what do you think needs to happen? Uh, like I said, I think mentorship is the best way. Uh there's a movie called Absent. Uh I'm trying to remember who was the director. But I found out about it because uh, James Hetfield was a part of that. And it's all about how absent fathers uh, and like them finding father figures and like what they went through. And while they didn't necessarily choose violence, a lot of them chose drugs or something else. Just not having that involved father figure in some way, shape or form. I think that's one of the key things. And while a biological father may not be a possibility in all situations having a mentor figure fill that role uh, i think is just extremely important sure so i i'll acknowledge that for for sure Mm -hmm. and i'm gonna push back against that a little bit is that okay Mm -hmm. yeah challenging my worldview i like that (laughs) (laughs) i mean i i don't i I agree with you 100 Mm percent. i think there's just a shortcoming that i see there which i'd love to get your thoughts on which is Mm -hmm. So earlier we were talking a little bit about, you know, the the message that you got from your counselor, which is like, yes, this thing is bad and yes, it is true. Mm-hmm. And that's not necessarily in your control. And what concerns me about a lot of your uh, solutions, and I think they're good ones for the record, mm-hmm. is that like if I'm the person who's struggling, mm-hmm. I can't or I, maybe this is where I'm wrong, but. I view like lack of mentorship. You're kind of talking about it as a societal problem and absence of fathers. But like what, like if I'm 13 years old and I'm thinking about hurting my classmates, like what do I do? Okay. So I was mis, I was misunderstanding your question. I thought you were asking more like, what could we as a society do versus no, I, what? I, okay, I, yeah. I was, a, it was an open question. So I think you answered okay. it fine. So now let's tunnel down a little bit further. So if I was that person again, I would, again, just start looking for ways you're generalizing and things that aren't true. So yes, this person may be bullying you or, you know, whatever is causing whoever it is that's the enemy in your mind. Make sure you're not overgeneralizing for one. And then you're going to have to take steps backwards to why are you angry? And if that anger is justified, what is the healthy way to deal with that anger? And 99.999% of the time, it's not to hurt somebody else. Hmm. Like it's one thing to be angry to like protect somebody. Like if somebody's over here punching my friend, like there's going to be some anger and I'm going to go and defend my friend. But that's more out of love for my friend as opposed to that. If you're looking at, those situations 
it's you've got to realize it's not your place to do it and that there is also like things that are better moving forward yeah so i'll i i love that answer and i'm going to continue to push yeah because like mm -hmm. when you're saying you know start to realize you're over generalizing but like i think part of the problem is that you know in your mind it's not an over generalization mm -hmm. so what how do you think we kind of deal with that right because these people believe mm -hmm. that this is it's not a generalization this is a truth mm -hmm. yeah this this would be Honestly, I don't have a great answer for it outside of just seek mentorship. Uh, so there is, again, that there's only so much you can do by yourself with the limited amount of knowledge you have. And that mentorship could just be listening to a podcast that challenges your worldview. Like it may not be an individual person at first, mm -hmm. but uh, I think as, just kind of as a society, we've kind of gotten to a point where we don't really let our worldviews be challenged and so like violence or is like a generalized or anger is a generalized response to that mm. uh and so maybe not start with something that challenges like the fundamental existence of your worldview but just ever so slightly disagrees with it so what and so I what I'm going to kind of take away from that. And that's fine. Like, it, I mean, yeah. you don't have the answer. I don't have the answer. I don't think anyone has yeah. the answer. If someone had a very clear answer, I don't think we would be in this situation. Yeah. So I think that's fair game, but what I'm sort of, uh, what I'm almost taking away from that, or this is how I interpret it and apply my own, how this is how I'm filtering mm -hmm. what you're saying is that at the end of the day, I think it's actually a really important point that this may not be solved entirely on your own. Yeah. Which is really interesting because I think that oftentimes when it comes to people who are considering violence in this situation, the weight of the responsibility is placed on that person, right? We blame that mm -hmm. person for thinking these things. We mm -hmm. blame that person for having these kinds of like thoughts and intentions and stuff like that. And is there some amount of blame there? Do we want to restrict their behaviors and potentially even punish them? Like, absolutely. But one thing that I'm hearing from you is that, and I think your story kind of illustrates it. I don't know that you could have brute forced your way out of that hole. And in fact, what your story kind of illustrates is that it takes a guardian angel to pull someone out of there. Yeah. Right. And, and like, that's like, that terrifies me because I think you could be right. And what that sort of means is that the responsibility actually doesn't necessarily fall on the person. It falls on us. I think to a certain degree, like, it's not 100% either way. Sure. I think there's a sliding scale between individual responsibility and corporate responsibility. And okay. so as we take, like, let's say to get to a certain point, our responsibility as a society has to be at like 50%. So like if overall we're, if we drop below 50% between the individual responsibility and corporate responsibility, we're going to have a bad time in some way. Got it. And so I'm just using that as a ex generalized number, not sure. a hard fact. But I think there's only so much an individual can do to get there. And then if the corporate responsibility like keeps shrinking, that's going to go away. Or if the individual's responsibility starts shrinking in their capacity, then it gets closer to that point. So Yeah, so I'm I'm really hearing it's shared responsibility and furthermore that there's also only so much that society can do. And at some point the individual has to start taking responsibility for their feelings, mm -hmm. their thoughts, their reactions, their behaviors, yeah. um, trying to improve their life. Mm -hmm. What what would you like so let's say that someone's watching this um, which is exactly why we're doing it, and is having mm -hmm. thoughts of violence, what would you recommend for someone like that? Uh, reach out to a healthy gamer community. I mean, that's, <laughs> you know, number one. Uh, you know, it's community. Like, that's... Okay. You get something... Open get some people gates. involved in your life. Yes. Like, uh, you know, th this may not be the best place to be able to help with these specific issues, but I'm sure uh, Dr. K in this community knows who to send you to. 
Okay. <laughs> I don't know that we do, but all right. Uh, so, yeah. so, but well, I, I think yeah. the message that I'm hearing is, so don't I, I, isolate yourself. Yeah. So, so, but it really is reach out to help. But like, what, mm-hmm. what do you think? How do you think someone should reach out to help or for help? So this is where it's difficult depending on where you're at, because there are places with great mental health situations, and then there are places without it uh and uh there's obviously like the national suicide hotline uh i think that would be a good place as well because even if it's not necessarily suicide you're struggling with it's still that desire for violence and it's just towards others instead of yourself uh there's a lot of parallels there and they would have they would probably have the better resources than Healthy Gamer would uh, to deal with these situations. Yeah, I mean, so so I'm I'm really proud of our community, and I I just don't know. Um, so well, I, just I, like that, yeah, just like that girl uh, in middle school, she wasn't fully equipped with a PhD to deal with me. Uh, yeah, but there was enough community there to help me then start to apply what the counselor was saying. Yeah, so I, I and I, I face farmed a little bit as a meme, but but I, yeah. I, I do think that we've uh, opened our doors in a good way to a lot mm-hmm. of people who have participated in toxic corners of the internet. And I'm mm-hmm. actually like really happy. Like it was rocky for a while, but now I think that there's actually like more and more productive discussion, for example, around gender dynamics and stuff. Like I see a lot more compassion, a lot more desire to understand, um, a lot more like, you know, like, uh, so I, I recently saw a post that was really interesting about a woman who posted about her experience on dating apps and, mm-hmm. and how she basically like always has matches mm-hmm. and how she even acknowledges that, like, I never realized that like men had it so hard and my experience is completely different. It's like, it's a never ending mm-hmm. source of matches for me. And she also went on to kind of share that what I started to realize is like I participated in the app, not out of a desire. And I, I may be like, you know, oversimplifying here, but or mm-hmm. I certainly am. But that it was really like ego gratification for her um, mm-hmm. and, and to, to feel like really, really validated and, and feel great about herself, which I think is kind of interesting because I think a lot of the the kind of incelish mindset believes that sort of thing. But to hear another mm-hmm. person sort of say, hey, this isn't good or healthy or I actually don't want this. Mm-hmm. Um, and it can be somewhat true, I thought was just really eye-opening. Um, so it, it sounds like you're kind of saying, like, reach out for some kind of help. Yeah. Uh, like I said, it's, there is a sort, like I said, it's a sliding scale. And, you know, like I said at the beginning, like, Western ideology tends to be hyper-individualistic and ignores that community plays a role in people's well-being at all and it's all pull yourself up by your bootstraps and then eastern communities tend to be the opposite and it's all about you were born into this family and so that is your community now and forever and it doesn't matter who you are you are not an individual you are part of this unit and i think the truth is somewhere in between that as well as responsibility for what's going on in the world yes there's some ultimate individual responsibility but there's also a level of corporate responsibility that we share sure. as fellow human beings. Absolutely, man. So, uh, um, JC, let me ask you kind of like a, this is going to be sort of like a, maybe an inflammatory question and let me know if you don't want to answer it. Um, mm-hmm. Is there any part of you that regrets not becoming violent? Like, what do you think about the path that you chose to take? And, and do you think that you know, do, do you regret it at all? I know it's kind of a weird question. I don't regret not being violent, but I also don't regret going through that thought process to a certain extent to then be able to understand people. Uh, so I don't necessarily re- regret going down that path, but I definitely would have regretted finishing out that path if that makes sense makes a lot of sense so what i'm hearing is that it it sort of really helped you understand a lot about life and like how to organize the way that you interact with the world the way that you understand yourself 
are you kind of, so if you didn't regret going down that path, how happy are you that with where you are now? And like, what do you think about not choosing that path? Uh, I think it's, it's really helped me understand why people get angry at smaller things that are much smaller, at least in my mind. So it's just like, if I can get that angry about name, I'm going to minimize, you know, minimize Mm -hmm. my trauma now, but, uh, like I can, if I can get that mad about name calling, uh, you know, of course now I understand how somebody could get mad and be violent about their candidate not winning or, Hmm. you know, someone saying something against their religious view. It's like, I can understand that. I'm not going to agree with it, but now I can at least understand how their thought process got them there and empathize with them as humans and then maybe point them, be like, hey, I was on that path too. Here's a better one. So you do think the path that you took is better? Yes. What makes it better? Uh, so just it better for humanity as a whole. Uh, again, I think... Just it, like that's my individual responsibility pouring into the corporate responsibility for other people. What does that mean? So just like there's individual responsibility uh, for me in my life, there's also a part of my individual responsibility that plays into like the societal corporate responsibility that affects everyone else. So to be a little bit more concrete, in what ways do you think the path that you chose is better than the one that you didn't? Uh, One, I didn't kill people. Uh, I think that's a net positive. (laughs) Okay. So you you see Uh, that as a net positive. Yeah. So, uh, and then two, uh, it's allowed me to then help other people through things. Uh, Just because I've, because I went through this at such a young age, I had to question everything and get down and like understand all these very deep questions very early on. Uh, and so there's been times where I've had friends uh, like who were like having marriage problems <laughs> and me who's never dated anybody in my entire life uh, would sit down with them and just like, well, it sounds like you're holding this point of worldview and that's just not true because of x y and z and that's why Mm. you're so being able to dive so deep into all these like philosophical things is able just like well here's your overarching thing that you're dealing with that's affecting your marriage or affecting the relationship with your child and so while i don't necessarily have the idea of how to apply that in your situation like Here's like at least like a general theme you could maybe think about and run with. Yeah, so I'm, so I'm I'm hearing that this whole journey, in addition to you know, not hurting other people, which is is a net positive for you, and I think most people would agree with that. I certainly agree with that. Um, I'm also hearing that you actually developed a lot of compassion and understanding, mm-hmm. and yeah. that by sort of taking responsibility in your own life, you've mm-hmm. now been able to be a part of like the positive community for other people. Yeah. That's great, man. I'm, I'm really happy to hear that. And, um, yeah. Anything else that you want to add or any questions that you've got for me? Otherwise I think we can move over to, uh, watching that clip and then maybe like getting your thoughts on it. Uh, I don't really think I have any questions. Uh, I just think, like I said, you know, we have that corporate responsibility, but there's also that individual responsibility. And so, it's never going to be 100% clear as to whose fault it is. Uh, but it, as long as we can start acknowledging that nuance is there, uh, I think we can make progress as a society to not put it all on them, but then also not ignore, like, well, we pushed them to that point, and it's their mm-hmm. fault they did that. Uh, but at the same time, I think there's certain cases where nah, that was a hundred percent on them or 98 percent on them sure. and yeah so i i, it, I, I if really we can like, approach things with that perspective i think it would be helpful i really like the the frame that you put about you know we may have so i think people are ultimately responsible for their actions but we're in for 
you know, a lot of trouble if we don't acknowledge how we push people. Yeah. Right. So, so we, like, I kind of think about society as like the risk factors for something and certain things that happen will amplify the risk. And at the end of the day, you can like, you know, blame someone for smoking, let's say, but what Mm -hmm. were the risk factors that this person was dealing with? Did they have parents who smoke? What was the advertising situation like? Were cigarettes easily available? Like there are all kinds of risk factors that go into whether someone engages in a behavior and as a society, I think we're responsible for those risk factors, but ultimately the, I believe that the ultimate responsibility is with the individual. Yeah. I think the inverse of that is true. Like the risk factors of you going to college and getting a degree or going into trade school, like those are also like, we can take that same idea and put it on the positive spectrum as well. Oh, absolutely. So, so there are, uh, there yeah. So I think when we when we use the phrase risk factor, that implies that this is a negative and we're looking at negative outcomes. But I would completely agree that, you know, there's lots of data, for example, that um, building something positive helps people achieve an outcome. Like my favorite recent study was one that looked at pornography addiction and the feeling of meaninglessness in mm-hmm. life. And the more meaningless someone's life is, the more likely they are to be addicted to pornography. And mm-hmm. so the the converse of that is how do you reduce meaninglessness? It's helping people find meaning, which is like one of these positive risk mm-hmm. factors where we yeah. sort of help people discover meaning. And then what we tend to see is that their addictions improve. Mm-hmm. So I, I completely agree with that. Anyway, yeah. let's hop. Uh, was there anything else that you wanted to share that I, we didn't talk about or that you didn't that I didn't ask about? No, I, I think we covered pretty much all of it. Uh, OK, or actually, there was one thing that I did want to mention so uh and this is just more so on the lines of uh like the types of attackers uh so i was what you would consider like a lone wolf uh is the terminology for it and i think that our discussion was very heavily focused on that type of person who becomes and thinks about it of themselves uh there's still other factors like that uh those who are like radicalized and so those who have outside people trying to push them, actively mm. push them, not like to do make them do that intentionally, not just pushing them by being bullies. And then there's also people with, uh, I'm not sure the technical term for it, but like the, I guess like the stereotypical schizophrenic person, like serial killer from movies. Like those are separate issues from my situation and those need to be contextualized differently oh yeah i would completely agree with that i think i recently saw a a mental illness analysis of people who commit mass violence and um finding i don't remember what the exact uh, uh details of the study were i don't remember the numbers but essentially discovering a shockingly low amount of mental illness in people Mm -hmm. who commit mass violence yeah. And and so in, in the data actually shows that while people with, for example, schizophrenia um, may be more violent than the average person, and even mm-hmm. then I'm not sure if that's entirely true, the percentage of people who have a psychotic disorder who are violent is actually like very, very, very small. Yeah. And, and so usually when we see like people who are mentally or who have some kind of diagnosis who are violent, the most common cause is something like substance use. So a lot of Mm -hmm. people who are like high on like meth or whatever, and like they can become violent like pretty easily. But generally speaking, most people who are mentally ill, including bipolar disorder or schizophrenia are not violent. Yeah. So I'm glad you kind of drew that distinction. And it's also interesting because we've done some work um, and in sort of helping some institutions like uh, the United Nations understand this process of radicalization and inciting people to violence, which is actually like a different process from what you're kind of describing. So I I really appreciate you kind of drawing those distinctions. Cool, dude. Okay, so So let's take we're ready to check this video. (laughs) Yeah, let me um, let me just figure out how we're going to do this. So what I'm going to do, we're going to watch it on Loretta's. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't know if I if I share a, a uh, I don't know if you're going to be able to hear this. Can you uh, see this? Yeah. Okay. So 
Um, all right, and then let's go to uh, okay. So let's let's go ahead and, and take a look at this. Is what you're seeing, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's go ahead and watch a song for a woman that I kind of like, mm -hmm. and uh, I got there, and she saw me, and she immediately pulled away, and uh, I I wasn't forcing her li to listen or anything. You know, mm -hmm. I just wanted to play the song for her. You know, give her her own choice yeah. if she wanted to be with me. You know? Okay. Does she know you? Yeah, I worked with her there for like five, six months. Did y'all have a relationship? No, we were talking a little bit, but it never really got serious. Okay. But anyways, I pulled up there and I was in the other parking lot and I saw her get in her car and I, saw, I was like, oh shoot, it's my moment. So I pulled up there next to her and she pulled away from me and uh, so I chased her a little bit just because I'm I don't know. Women are crazy. Like, I felt like she, like, wanted me chasing. Do you not think chasing somebody's crazy? Well, it's just, like, I, I only went, like, a couple blocks down the street. I'm just saying, don't you think chasing somebody's crazy when they, when they obviously don't want to? Well, I had my song playing, and I wanted to, like, her to hear it, maybe. Well, apparently, but... she didn't want to hear it, right? So what else happened? Let's get on with the story. Um, well, anyways, her, her father called me up, and he made some threats to me and to my life. Okay. And so I just want to have his name what, on file. What, what did he say to you? Uh, I think he said he's gonna stab me, like, but he, he's like cussing at me. He said that, or he did say that. He said he says I'm gonna do something to you. I swear I do something to you. For chasing your daughter? Yeah, but it wasn't chasing. It was like going down a couple streets. Like, that's like fun to women. Like women like that. A little no, bit of excitement. Don't. No, they don't. Well, women don't like to be chased. What about like? If I was a father, I'd probably tell you the same thing. What about like BDS and porn, where women like to be have rape fantasies? Well, apparently this girl doesn't. Well, who knows? Most women do like having rape fantasies. Okay. Do you think she does? I don't know. But Apparently she don't. Well, so, so what do you want us to do? Well, I just want you to get his name on file just in case he does do anything do you, do to you me. Do you know his name? I know his daughter's name. What well, do you know his name? I know her name. I don't know his name. He called me from a restricted phone number. Okay. Here's, no here, here's my suggestion. Leave her alone. Well, this is one song I made, and this was the final chance I was going to have. Here's my chance. Here, here's my advice. It's over. Leave her alone. Okay. Right, let's just pause for a second. So what do, yeah. you, what do you think about this so far? So the main thing I'm noticing is, like, the inability to read social cues, uh, and then also, like, a lot of cognitive dissonance uh, as to he believes so much that she's going to like him. Uh, that he's justifying all of her actions as ways that she's showing that she likes him, even though that's not the case. And so, so I think that's a clear example of like the cognitive dissonance of, oh, well, women like to be chased. That's why she was running away from me. And so I think that's like a very clear, so, I think. So is that is that something that, that uh, I mean, I'm going to kind of set you up here. <laughs> JC, so please take this with oh, a grain no. of salt. But like, you know, like you having been in a very dark place, is that something that you can kind of like understand? Oh yeah, there so, was definitely a lot of cognitive dissonance between what was happening uh, in my life uh, and the way I was relating to people. It was everything somebody did was an attempt to bully me, even if they were nice or even if it was genuine, like it took a lot for me to, uh, like I said, with this girl to realize it took me a week for me to be like, okay, she's not setting me up for some trick here. Uh, and mm. so there is that cognitive dissonance in my mind. It's on the opposite spectrum of everybody hates me. And so anything somebody does towards me is some sort of setup. He's kind of got the inverse of that where it's, she likes me, so therefore everything she does is a way to show her she likes me. Uh, Got it. Even though so, that's not true. So what I'm kind of hearing is once you have a conclusion in your mind, that conclusion shapes the information as opposed to the information shaping the conclusion. Yes. Okay. Um, and, and just, you, you know, for... One thing that I'd encourage you to do as you're kind of thinking about this, what I'm really looking for, JC, is like your understanding based on your mm -hmm. experience as mm -hmm. opposed to 
inferring what this person believes. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Yeah. So I, I actually don't think it's fair for us to assume particular things about this person. The reason that I'm uh, watching this clip with you is because I think that you've got like a unique perspective on being able to relate to some of these mm -hmm. things. And I'd love it if you could sort of share that part. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Should we keep going? Yeah. Um, actually, but uh, before we do, let me just ask you. So there are a couple things that I noticed about this video. I'm not even going to comment about the person. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you notice about the cops? They're very defensive and their hands are already on their tasers. They're expecting something to potentially happen. And, uh, and But also I know that can be habit for some, that can be training as well. Uh, there's a lot of police departments now that, uh, because it's just kind of natural to put your hands somewhere, they're training them to put them on their non-lethal or less lethal option. So that way, that's the first thing they'll react to versus their lethal option if something turns violent. And and what do you think? So the, the cops are basically like advising someone. And, and now I'm mm -hmm. going to kind of ask you to lean a little bit in on your own experience. Mm -hmm. um, how receptive do you do you imagine someone in this situation is to what the cops are saying? He, or it feels like he showed up with an agenda of like, I'm right. And so like, he doesn't, or I wouldn't care what the cops were saying to me. It's, I have come to present my case and X, Y, Z needs to happen. And so therefore you need to do X, Y, Z. Why are you not doing X, Y, Z? And so I'm oh. wondering if this kind of relates to what you were saying, even when you were working with the counselor, about in one ear and out the other. Mm -hmm. So just, yeah. just to share a little bit about my experience with this sort of stuff. So what I'm sort of noticing is that um, I, I don't think they're taking this person's concerns seriously. And I'm really concerned when I see an interaction like this that these cops are not being that person that mm -hmm. you needed, right? Yeah. They're, they're not actually like listening to him. They're, um, and even if you disagree factually with, with what he's saying, and I'm not blaming the cops for this because I think that it's a, it's a shocking kind of situation, right? And they're giving mm -hmm. very, very clear direction about what is, they're trying to show this person, hey, like if you pull up to someone and, and they drive away, like you should interpret that appropriately mm -hmm. or differently from the way that you are. But this is something that I've kind of noticed is that when people trigger a particular kind of like, you know, and so people are calling this person a stalker, which may be more fair, but you got called a stalker too, right? Mm -hmm. And and once we sort of trigger this kind of response that it's like very, very ostracizing. Yes. And And so what I'm also kind of noticing here is a complete lack of compassion based on kind of like a survival and a fear response, which once again mm -hmm. is understandable. Yeah. But I, I think that this that's commonly what happens. Mm -hmm. All right, let's keep going. Yeah, but that's the thing is she needs to have her own free will, man. You listen, do you not understand? Listen, I'm listen, a man myself, listen, bro, and listen, I have needs listen, myself. She, she's choosing her free will by telling her daddy what happened to you, and I'm telling you, stay away from her because he will hurt you probably. She's being controlled by him. That's, that's fine. That's fine. That's, that's her choice, right? Free well, choice, free will. I think she should go do porn. Okay, you need to leave. It's legal. You need to leave. Well, we're not doing anything. You need to leave. I'm, I'm having discussion on. I'm having discussion telling you to leave. Are you threatening me with I'm arrest? I'm not threatening you. I'm telling you to leave. This we're is done. a public property. We're done. Well, you can stay if you want. If you if you we're if done. you if you do that on public property, I'll, you know, I'll leave you're, under. You're free. You're free to do whatever you want to do right here. But we're not doing anything else. I'm just giving you advice. The girl doesn't want to talk to you. Leave. Yeah, but there's, there's something twisted about that. There's something twisted about the way you think. I, I was gonna let her make her own choice after the okay. song. Well, she's made her choice. And I just don't think she had a reasonable opportunity to make a choice because I'm going to blow up and I'm going to be a famous how, DJ and I'm going to be how, like... How old is she? Uh, two years older than me. 27. How much? 27. She still doesn't make her own mind. I'll speak with her. Is she working today? Uh, I think so. Do you have her phone number? Uh, I believe so. Uh, but I can't stop recording the video. Well, that's okay. I'll go buy her a job. She works at Cracker Bar, right? Correct. Okay, I'll speak with her and then I'll get back with you, okay? All righty, sounds All good. Right, go. no Thank problem. you guys. So I'm going to go ahead and stop here because I don't mm -hmm. want to um, show this person's face. Mm -hmm. But, um, I mean, they, they put it on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, you know, their choice, but we're not going to kind of go there. I, I'm just kind of curious, like, 
you know, what what amount of like what do you relate to in this this video? And I, I realize that your situation was like somewhat different. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but like, you know, what what do you relate to? What can you help us kind of understand? Like. I would say the biggest thing that I noticed is there's like already at a conclusion in everyone's mind in that conversation as to what's going on. There's no back and forth to try and get to what's going on. Like the officer has already made his assumption. It appears the guy's already made his assumption about what's happened. There's not a dialogue. It's I'm right. No, I'm right. It, they're competing and they're just talking at each other saying, I'm right. No, I'm right. That's the big thing that I picked away from that conversation. And is that similar to kind of what you went through? Uh, very much so. How uh, so? Uh, specifically in the instance where I was being punished for getting punched in the back of the head. Mm -hmm. uh, like it was very much, no, you did something wrong. It's like I sat there and got punched in the back of the head. How was that wrong? It's like, well, you should have come up with a solution. It's like I came up with the solution but he couldn't come up with one. And so that's why we both got written up. It's like, well, why did he look sorry and you didn't? And so that very much like gaslighting, uh, at least in my case, okay. with that situation. But I think a lot of that was very, uh, for that interaction there, there was just preconceived notions on both ends that were just slapping up against each other versus trying to come alongside each other and being like, well, why do you think she would leave? Could it be versus, oh, no, she definitely doesn't like you, so just back off. It's, yeah. And that may be true, but uh, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but like with Alzheimer's, it's not the best idea to just be like, no, no, this is what happened, grandma. It's like entering into their world and just being relationally with them. Yeah, I, uh, it depends. <laughs> it, yeah. Uh, so, like, I think taking a approach of getting into their worldview enough to then make that small course correction uh, yeah, versus so trying to just deny the way they're seeing things outright. I, I think one of the things that I took away from uh, your story, JC, was that you know, you kind of emphasize questioning, but mm -hmm. what I also like, what I sort of noticed is that there's dialogue, right? Yes. It, it, and, and what I'm kind of hearing you react to is that, that in your situation, there really wasn't dialogue in this situation. You're not really seeing dialogue that there. And, and that's what really kind of terrifies me about this is that I think when we, when I've worked with people who are sort of like, let's say in this vein, um, what what I've sort of found is that there is an appropriate uh, fear-driven reaction that can sometimes really get amplified into labeling people, right? And in this case, like you could argue that stalker is somewhat appropriate. Um, but but then I, I think kind of like what, what I've also seen is that people will sort of kind of do the same thing w that you were kind of thinking about doing, which is like, well, if people are bl blaming me for being a stalker, like if people are calling me a stalker and all I did was play some music, like I might as well. Mm -hmm. Right. And I've seen this a lot also in, in the patients that I've worked with who have addictions and when they get blamed for being an addict, even if they're mm -hmm. sober, because like, oh, like because you're an mm -hmm. addict. Right. Yeah. And, and then what they'll end up doing is like, well, if I'm going to like. I might as well use if people are going to like treat me like an addict and it's kind of this mm -hmm. weird sort yeah. of logical fallacy or it's kind of like if I'm going to if I'm doing the the time I might as well do the crime. Yeah. And and it's it's really kind of a harmful sort of situation and what I'm really terrified by is after hearing your story I I'm not sure what the right answer here is but I'm I'm concerned that in situations like this people who are judged harshly, which may be somewhat appropriate. Mm -hmm. There's also a lack of dialogue, lack of compassion, lack of like, because I'm not sure that in this interaction, this person really digested or understood yeah. anything that the cops were saying. Yeah. Uh, 
it's very hard that you don't really win arguments by going, you know, uh, Hey, you're just wrong and I'm right. And that's how a lot of conversations go. Uh, and then that, when it becomes that, Hey, you're just wrong and I'm just right. That then feeds into the us versus them mentality. Uh, and so whenever you're having those conversations, it's very difficult to break that down if somebody is already approaching it from that perspective and to have those conversations. Yeah. Any other kind of thoughts about um, and any light that you can shed based on your own experience about like in this situation or anything that you would kind of suggest for people who are sort of feeling this way? Uh, I would say again, reach out and try and have a diverse community. Uh, I think that's definitely the thing that has helped me out the most. Uh, cause I didn't just stick in my Southern Baptist bubble. Uh, you know, uh, I hung out with assembly of God, people, charismatics, uh, there was a Hindu kid that I uh, got to talk to a little bit. Uh, he was a great above me, so I only got to see him a couple times at lunch. And so just diversifying the input in my life kind of accelerated and let me kind of see one where everyone was coming from, but then also kind of just process other worldviews and then also see, okay, like maybe this is right or maybe this is right. Or maybe they're both paradoxically true in some way and we can, and I can think through both of them existing simultaneously. Uh, and so not just having one side or one person speak into your life. Uh, yeah, so, I, I think yeah. that that's, that's a really fantastic point. I mean, I, I think what we've sort of seen from our research into online radicalization is that echo chambers are a huge part of it. Yeah. And that, you know, it's it's really the people, and this is what I'm really grateful to our community for, and, and I appreciate the, you know, the plug that you offered. Mm -hmm. Secretly, I'm, a, uh, I'm terrified that a lot of, like, people who are on the road to violence are now going to show up after watching this. And I don't know if we can handle that. But um, what, what I think is really fantastic about our community is that we do offer, like, different perspectives. That's a big part of what we're about. Mm -hmm. I don't think we offer, and there's a slight caveat here, which is we're not, we're not actually here to offer different perspectives. We're actually here to grow as individuals. And as mm -hmm. part of that, that involves sharing your perspective and listening to the perspective of others. Um, I think the biggest problem that we see in our community, I would say, is that people don't really re acknowledge, I think, that everything that you say impacts other human beings. And so a lot of people feel ostracized from other communities and will come to us. But mm -hmm. also to remember that there is an individual responsibility here about how you speak and mm -hmm. that your words can be helpful or harmful to other people. And it's not actually all about you. Yeah. And we're, we're here for you, but you should also be here for us. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing that I would kind of say in this situation is like, I'm going to do a straight plug for therapy. I know that when you sort of yeah. originally talked about, uh, y you know, what really helped you the most, it was actually a peer, which I think mm -hmm. is really powerful. And there's research that actually shows that that's oftentimes the case. Yeah. Um, if I can clarify that it's therapy definitely helped. Like CBT was a huge part of it. Uh, so cognitive behavioral therapy, uh -huh. uh, learning that. But it, it takes kind of both because you need a stable community to then like really process those things unless you're just extremely mentally strong already. Uh, and so it, it takes both, uh, yeah. not just a peer. It took the peer to give me enough hope to then try the CPT. And so yeah, it so was... It it both were needed. It's funny yeah. that you mentioned that because we actually like the data very much supports that view that... Um, just to give you like a couple bits of data from our own internal stuff. So one is that we find that, so we have a peer support coaching program and we find that it's very complementary to therapy, like that the two are definitely not replacements for each other. Um, and, and that like they work well synergistically, actually kind of like mm -hmm. diet and exercise. 
And then the other thing that's really interesting about that is that uh, I would say somewhere between maybe 10 and 20% of people who enter our coaching program will then go on to therapy, like in a very like amicable and positive way, because they kind of mm -hmm. realize that, oh, like, actually, I, like I can talk to people and there's there meet needs that I have that are not being met through coaching. And then they'll they'll actually move into therapy. The main mm -hmm. reason that I was kind of talking about therapy in this situation is if if people are watching this and can relate to you mm -hmm. um, and can relate to the person that we watched, I think the challenge is that oftentimes if you go to peers or if you do something like go to police, you're going to get the reaction that this person got. Yeah. which is, I would argue, both appropriate and lacking Incomplete. in some degree of compassion, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it's you could also make a very good argument that it's not a police officer's job to offer compassion. It's a, their job to ensure safety, which is exactly what they're doing. So this isn't a criticism of the police. But if you really think about, okay, where is the one place that you can go where you can share anything? And it is literally the person's responsibility to try to demonstrate some degree of compassion, understanding, and empathy and engage you in dialogue that is designed for like your benefit without being like harshly judgmental and writing you off. Like that's like literally what a therapist's job is. Yeah. And, and so when I see interactions like this, I kind of think a little bit about, okay, like what, how would this person's life, uh, we're presuming that they're not in therapy, maybe they are, who knows. Um, but how would this person's life be different if there was like a single human being? Because what I really heard from your story is like, it just takes one human being mm -hmm. um, to to really, you know, you've been pushed to the edge. People are bullying you. The authority figures that are supposed to protect you are like, they're not on your side. And in fact, they're being played and sort of almost willingly played or even just like apathetically played by the people who are actually bullying you. So it's mm -hmm. like uh, th there's just a lack of safeguards. The other thing that I think really uh, I, I I really empathize with and and really like struggle when I think about what these people are going through is that you basically should have had a number of different things that should have gone like gone well for you. Like either you had friends or you had teachers who were kind of aware or authority figures who like like recognize that this kind of isn't your fault. You had teachers who were standing three feet away when you were getting bullied and like didn't really do much about it. And you even had a parent who, when you got suspended, their first response was like, do you realize how this makes me look? As well as whatever kinds of challenges that, that the people in your household faced, right? Like sometimes people struggle with addiction. Sometimes people struggle with mental illness. Like that's sort of not their fault. But what I'm mm -hmm. really kind of noticing is that this outcome came from a failure of multiple safeguards. Yes. And I think what we're what we're really lacking in society is an appreciation of like how many things have to go wrong. And this is what I love about the conversation yeah. with you is really appreciating how many things have to go wrong to push a human being to the edge of violence. Yeah. And I, I don't get the sense that we as a society have elucidated that or understand that. Instead, yeah. what we tend to do is respond reflexively with judgment, which once again may be like somewhat appropriate, right? Because yeah. in this There's kind of There's still an individual responsibility that I hold for absolutely getting to that point. Right. Uh, and and then it's society may have made that choice easier, but it was still my choice. Absolutely. And I and I love that nuance. But I, I think that's also where like we've got to kind of acknowledge that people who are prone to violence are not usually born that way, that it takes like failure after failure after failure that really pushes them to the edge. And and I, I actually think a lot of people who are oftentimes pushed to the edge of violence will actually decide, I'd say the majority decide not to commit violence. In fact, it's the mm -hmm. it's a real, real minority that goes down that route. Um, and I think there's probably data to support that. But and this is one of those things where all the people who decide not to do stuff, like we never hear from them, right? Yeah. I mean, so you're kind of the exception, which is why we're grateful that you came today. But most of the time they just get close to the edge and then they sort of like pull back and then they go on 15 years later to build some kind of life and then you're never going to know. Yeah. Anyway, I, I really appreciate you coming on. Any kind of like last thoughts or questions before we wrap up for the day? Uh, no. Uh, I mean, just, I think just uh, again, just it, 
as long as we can keep approaching that nuance uh, and start to have that individual and corporate responsibility discussion uh, when addressing not only violence, but any other mm. social ill, uh, I think that will move things forward a lot better than the bickering we typically do in politics. Yeah, I mean uh, that. <laughs> So it it just feels like it, the one side it's all individual person and and it's all about them and then the other side it's no it's it, only the community's fault that this person's in this situation and it's we need that nuance in every conversation not just this one cool so it sounds like that's that's i mean any other final words directed like if there's someone who's considering violence who's watching this right now like anything that you would want to any message that you want to send loud and clear to them uh it's not worth it for one uh there's way more opportunities in life than you think uh and as difficult as it is to think that there is a future for you there is and so hold on to that future you know it may seem like a long time away uh but the things that you are going to learn from struggling through this is going to help you help other people never to even get to this place mm. that you're at. And so you can help people stop halfway down the path versus 99% way down the path. And then they don't have to go through that last 49% that you went through. Yeah, well, I I can echo that. And I just want to say, JC, thank you so much for having this conversation because that's what I really hope yeah. is that you having gone through this dark period in your life, like so hopefully someone's listening to this and, and can see that 15 years later, like, you know, you, you can be yeah. intelligent, be, it sounds like you're somewhat content with life and, and not, you know, really, really upset about everything. Oh, no. Well, life is pretty, life is going pretty good. Oh. Yeah. So, and, and, and I, I, that's the challenge, right? Is what we tend yeah. to glorify, especially through the media is the people who commit violence. And then the people who are relatively content in life 15 years later, like we never hear from them. Yeah. And so I think what we're almost seeing is a selection bias mm -hmm. towards violence and kind of like media kind of inflammation where, where there's also yeah. research about, for example, suicide clusters and things like that, that mm -hmm. when there's when we popularize either violence or suicide, that we'll see an uptick in those kinds of behaviors. And, I, you know, we never yeah. hear from the people who ended up building something in their life. So thank you so yeah. much for sharing and thank you so much for coming on and hopefully altering the trajectory of, of some people who are in really dark places. Yeah. I said I came on just to try and give some people hope. And, you know, it, it is a long path, but to get back, but it is 100% worth it. Cool. Well, thank you very much, JC. Take care, yeah. buddy. Thank you. All righty. Yeah, so, um, you know, it's kind of tricky because we don't have these kinds of conversations, right? Like, we don't have these kinds of conversations. And I sort of get why. You know, it's it's so much easier to read a clickbait article about someone who commits violence. It's so much easier to watch something that is so viscerally and emotionally engaging like we did today. And it's really easy to like toss judgment out. But when I when I hear JC's story, I hear a lot of things that are really not in his favor. So we're hearing a parent who was arguably emotionally unavailable, a parent who struggled with an addiction, a sibling with mental illness, um, you know, parents who were somewhat overprotective. We're also hearing like a little bit of like, you know, JC needing to somehow balance out the badness of what their dad saw in their job, which is a big responsibility to place on a kid. And then you throw bullying into the mix, you throw sexual discrimination into the mix, you throw authority figures who aren't really like looking out for you into the mix, 
you throw parents who are more concerned about their own image than helping their child who's struggling. And what do you end up with? Right? You have a kid who everyone's calling a rapist, a stalker, whatever, gay. You know, and, and you've got no, like, people are doing bad stuff for you. People are supposed to be looking out for you. There's supposed to be a system in place that is supposed to provide fairness and justice. And when someone takes that, when that system that's supposed to provide fairness and justice provides neither of those things, you know, what I really heard from JC is that, like, you have to take justice into your own hands, become a vigilante, right? Because no one else is looking out for you. And the other really shocking thing is that it doesn't take much. It takes just a little bit of compassion. It takes one person showing up and saying, hey, I'm going to be your friend. And so, like, if you're listening to this and you're thinking about violence, the, I strongly, strongly encourage y'all to, like, listen to JC because he understands what y'all have gone through. Right? Because he's gone through it himself. Like, he was thinking about doing things and even, as he put it, did a dry run. And he was sure he was going to be successful. And when things feel really, really bleak, right, we think, oh, like, the hurt that I feel is so bad that nothing will be able to fix it. I need to commit a very great act. And that's not just, we're not just talking about violence here. We're also talking about things like, I failed out of college, so this was mine. You know, I basically failed out of college, and the only way I can make up for it is to go to Harvard, for example. Right? So the worse that we feel about ourselves, the darker our life becomes, the greater the thing that we need to do to balance it. And when you're in a really, really dark spot, you think that it takes a huge amount of stuff to actually fix your life. But if you really listen to JC's story, and I'd say that data supports this, the science supports this, it doesn't actually take a huge amount of stuff. It takes a tiny amount of stuff to completely turn around the trajectory of life. And this is where we have to understand there's a difference between velocity and acceleration. So even if you have a very strong, let's say, negative velocity, all it takes is a tiny bit of acceleration in the opposite direction to actually move you in the right direction. And this is the big thing that I think people don't understand about recovery in life. I've worked with patients who have been using heroin for 30 years. And they think, oh my God, I've been using heroin for 30 years. It's going to be so hard for me to become sober. How many days do they have to be sober to be one year sober? The same amount of days as if you were addicted to heroin for two years. What does it actually take to turn your life around? You just need a tiny amount of compassion. You need like one person. And that's why I would like, this is a case where I would strongly recommend therapy, right? Because there is, there is someone out there who's trained to be able to handle all of the dirty thoughts that you have. And that's what we're trained for. We go through years of training to be able to sit with the darkness inside you. And that's okay. It actually doesn't take a lot. It takes actually very little. And I've seen that time and time again, gives me hope for humanity. So if anything uh, my clinical experience has taught me, it's that like things are not as bad as we think they are. But I don't blame anyone for thinking that because why did you get to think that way? It's because you've been failed. I mean, the world has let you down over and over and over and over and over again, right? We see like a ton of different essentially safety nets give way. And so it just takes a little bit. It actually doesn't take a lot, which is hard to understand. And the last thing is that for those of you that aren't having thoughts like that, recognize that in order to alter, so if we go back to whoever this, the, the guardian angel was, right? This like 13 year old girl who like walked up to a kid who was struggling and said, I'm going to be your friend and diverted some amount of mass violence. And so we think about, like, 
being a doctor is like, oh, like, I'm going to be a doctor and I'm going to save lives. You don't have to be a doctor to save lives. You just have to be a good human being. And so as best as you can, we're not saying that you're responsible for diverting, you know, people who are thinking about mass violence, but like, try to be a decent human being. Because it doesn't take a whole lot. Like, you don't have to give a whole lot of compassion to like help someone who's in a really dark place. And what I'm hearing here is that, you know, we, we sometimes hear about this kind of stuff where like in Uvalde, Texas recently, there was a school shooting and there were like literally like 50 or a hundred or hundreds, I don't even know, of police officers outside the school. And we can kind of blame them for not stopping the shooting or whatnot. But I, I, what I want y'all to really realize is that one 13-year-old girl did more for the people in that school than 100 police officers. One 13-year-old girl did more than parents, teachers, whatever. And so, like, this is the key thing that I think we need to take away is that we can do a lot. We can do so much. But somewhere along the way, we started believing that we can't. We started looking at the world and seeing that the darkness in the world is so great that the problems are so gigantic that I have become insignificant. That I can't actually make an impact. And that's when we started, that's the reason the world is the way that it is. Because we as human beings started believing that we were ineffectual. And the moment we start believing we're ineffectual is when the world goes to shit. This can be true of the world and it can also be true in your own life. When you start believing that, oh, I can't fix this because this problem is too big. The moment you start thinking that is actually when your life starts going to shit. So it's kind of bizarre but what we actually need to do is just acknowledge that we have power in this world. Even in your own life or in some other life. Oh, sorry, I'm getting distracted by the garage door. But um. So like just just acknowledge for a moment that it doesn't take a whole lot to start to move your life in the other direction and acknowledge that it also doesn't take a whole lot for you to move someone else's life in the right direction. <laughs> and acknowledge that the garage door can has a powerful impact on the world too. Okay. Any questions before we wrap up for the day? Uh, so this is a pretty good question. One is, um, how do you express compassion for someone that you truly despise? So this is where it's going to sound kind of weird. I'd say you don't have to start there. Right? You don't have to start there. So I'd say, like, you don't have to express compassion for every human being. It's good if you do. But cut yourself some slack. Start by expressing some compassion towards yourself for struggling to express compassion for someone else. And when you're ready to really think about it, try to remember that human beings are to a certain degree a product of their circumstances. And that oftentimes even the people that we despise are living life in the best way that they can. So I, I think that's where, like, if you think about people that you despise, you know, there's a certain amount of that that is their fault, but there's a certain amount of that that is, like, was kind of the life that they grew up with. And I think the more that you acknowledge that, like, hopefully you can reduce the amount that you despise them, like, de from 100% down to, let's say, 50% or 60%. And then in that gap, hopefully there's space for compassion to grow. So Thanathoth is saying, so as long as I believe in myself and keep working, I'll fix my life eventually. So let's think about that for a second. So as long as I believe in my life and keep working, I'll fix my life eventually. Let's flip that statement around. If I don't believe in myself and if I stop working, 
Will my life be fixed? The answer to that question is clearly no. Right? So this is the tricky thing is the mind says, How, if I do this, I'll get it eventually, right? It's looking for a guarantee. But flip the question around. Will you do it eventually? I know this is going to sound kind of weird. I have no idea. But you're like, wait, Dr. K, if you have no idea, like, why should I do it? And I'm going to say, well, consider the opposite. If you stop believing in yourself and you stop trying, what's going to happen? Well, that certainly ain't going to work. So you might as well try. And it's that attitude that I'm going to try and I don't even know if this is going to work. That's actually the best attitude to have. Because it's when you look for your life being fixed eventually that then what starts to happen? Because you're like, I've been doing this a year. My, year. my life is not fixed. I've been doing this for two years. My life is not fixed. I've been doing this for three years. My life is not fixed. I'm doing this for four years. My life is not fixed. When is it going to be fixed? When is it going to be fixed? When is it going to be fixed? And as long as that eventually is in your mind, you're actually like never going to be satisfied with your progress because you're looking for a fixed life. So I would say that this is exactly what we mean by like when we say like there's a mindset shift because everyone's like shift your mindset. It is mindset. Performance mindset, growth mindset. You must mindset, once you, but the how. What does it look like? To shift your mindset means literally to notice some of your thoughts and not operate within those thoughts. I would even argue that if I do this, will it work eventually is the old mindset. It's just the reflection of it, but it's still the same mindset, which is that if I do A, B, and C, it'll be fixed at some point. And I think the right mindset is, even if it isn't going to be fixed, and I don't know it's going to be fixed, I'm going to try anyway, because that's what I can do. And once you start living life that way, it's not only liberating, but things get way, way easier. Right? It's like the difference between, okay, like how many... How many people do I need to ask out before I get married? If I keep asking people out, I'll get married eventually, right? And so you're making it like a numbers game. So like then you ask out a thousand people and lo, lo and behold, you're still not married. The right attitude is, okay, what can I do today to try to find companionship? What can I do today to try to find companionship? And the more that you focus on the here and now as opposed to filling in, like grinding towards your trophy in life, like it doesn't work like that. And why do we think it works like that? That's because what society has conditioned us to think. Right? Because like everywhere in our life, we're conditioned to think that you have to grind towards something. Even if we listen to JC, he's like, five more years of this, and then I'm free. He got freed way before five years. Four years of college, and then, I'm, then I live my golden life. I get a good job, the holy grail. And then you start your good, good job, and you're like, three years of this shit until I get promoted. Then I can do what I want. Five years of this shit until I get promoted. Then I can do what I want. And now you even have these fire people, right? Financial independence and retire early. So instead of retiring at 65, I'm going to grind my ass off for 25 years, and then I'm going to live the good life at 55. All the same thing. Eventually, 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 eventually. If you want to transform your life, get rid of the word eventually. Think about how damaging the word is. I'll get around to it eventually. I'll go to the dentist eventually. I'll buy floss eventually. I'll do my homework eventually. I'll be happy eventually. I'll find love eventually. Get rid of the word. Notice what your mind is doing. Everyone's saying is just do it. That's one translation of it. But the question is how? The, the method of just do it, the how, is in the word eventually. Notice what your mind says. And what behaviors do you justify by using the word eventually? 
And any behavior that comes out of the word eventually is one that you should be very critical of. So if your mind says eventually dot, 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 then be very careful about that strategy. And once you start to change that, your life will turn around.